Okay. Okay. You're you're all on, folks. Okay. So um, the reason um, I chose this topic because it, uh, apart from the fact that it's a bit esoteric, which I like, it en encompasses a broad range of inquiries into logic, language, metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics. Uh, contemplating on the nature of negation points to the boundaries of existence, the structure of language, and the limits of knowledge. I suppose it offers insights into complexities of human thought and the position of reality, which, which sounds like a very, very uh, casual light evening. So um, we assume that everything must have its equivalent not. But it's more complicated than that, of course. Otherwise, I wouldn't do it, would I? Um, the assumption is that there was a positive before it's negative. In other words, there was a an existence, a not-not, before a not, an is before a not-is, a plus before a minus. In practical terms, ontologically, the is and the isn't are present together to uh, for existence. However, that is not always the case, as I will show. Now, just want, I just, just want to be... Hi, Christina. Good to see you. Um, discussion, I just want to make it clear, but difficult, that discussion is not about nothing, but about not. We, 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 we discussed nothing about two years ago. And uh, those who've read my book, Nothing Matters, We'll, we'll know where I'm coming from. But um, uh, not runs parallel to nothing, but they're not always synonymous. I'll go into that later. Not surprisingly, the negative not is more common than the positive. Uh, this, this is not a hammer. That's not her name. You can go through a hundred names and still not get to her name. Hundreds of knots, and only one not not. For example, her name is Janet. Not, as far as we can see, is not binary. With is, with not not. Black is the opposite of white. But not black is not white. It could be any color of your choosing. If you come to the conclusion the universe is not cha chaotic, you will need to show in which way it is chaotic, or you need to show you need to show that it is chaotic. Do you? Chaotic has a ne negative connotation. That's the way I see it. Like terrible and awful, and uh, n n not terrible is not the opposite of is terrible. But here there are some binaries. For example, not happy and happy, miserable not miserable. So here the not can pre-exist the not not. So if I if I look at a, a change, not represents a change. Change can be discerned only afterwards, i.e. when the change has happened. Change is a spot where there is not what is becomes what was, or say a difference between what was to what had been. So not can be discerned only as the future after it has happened. If we think of not being a negative of what is, the latter, the not, i.e. the later happening, is always a more recent situation. So counterfactuals are always a more recent past. Now, how about the concept of not time? There is no such concept since time is change and change is time. I want to, uh, hi Roland, you made it. Good to see you, good to see you. Um, I want to, a word about uh, uh, re uh, re realism. Uh, the belief that there is an objective physical world whose properties are independent of what humans know or which experiments we choose to do. In other words, Reality, which consists of what is considered by physicists as real, even when there are no observers. So realism can contain a possible not, the observers. For me, 
This shakes the whole concept of realism. If one believes that there is reality, then you would need to believe in the concept of non-reality, i.e. not reality where there are observers. That's completely insane. That seems to get to the territory of Kant, who argued that our knowledge is constrained by the structure of our minds. So <laughs> believe, we believe we know things as they appear to us. But, says Kant, we can't get to reality, i.e. what things really are. So for Kant, not is the ultimate reality. That's how I see it. Um, many people object to the either or approach. There are greys, they say. But each gray must have a non-gray. If I speak about art for a second, art and not art. But what is not art? Presumably, we need to know what art is before we say what it what is not art or what art is not. So um, let me talk about God for a while, which I never do. But here we go, because we're going to speak about God in two ways. There are two ways referring to God. God has always been, i.e. there cannot be not God for believers. But there, there is God is not, which is negative theolo theology. The idea isn't new, by the way. Negative theology was a method of thought already in early Christianity and earlier within Platonism and Neoplatonism as a way to comprehend the divine by indicating everything it was not. It is obvious from this point of view that anything that can be said about God will be inadequate because it does not and cannot encompass what God is. So to say, uh, for example, um, that God is just is a problem, since it uses just in human terms, but does not represent what it means when applied to God. The point is that God's justice surpass, surpasses ours, so much so that it is inadequate to say the same name for it. Now, here comes the solution that is also the problem. In order to deal with inadequacy of applying just to God, one would need to say that God is not just. The problem, of course, is that it looks as though we are denying that God is just, whereas we are, in fact, saying that God is not just in the way that humans understand it. It is, it is negative theology says, impossible to make affirmative statements about the nature of God. Whatever we say God is, he is not. Um, I hope you got that. Now, while the negative theologian recognizes the necessary of speaking about what God he is, in fact, reduced to silence. For whatever he says, he would give the impression that he is comparing God to humans in some way. How then can we express, express the wonder of God? However difficult it is to grasp, um, what we have to get to is whereof one cannot speak, therefore one must be silent. Would sum it up perfectly as Wittgenstein's pithy one-liner at the end of his first great philosophical work, The Tractatus, in which he showed that reality, it is impossible to express anything through language. Trying to discuss philosophical ideas, he said, would necessarily lead to failure. On a similar tack, but connection with literature, the French philosopher Jacques Derrida demonstrates through his theory of deconstructions that while language often fails to say anything, it nevertheless says something even about what it fails to say. That point is that by being aware of what is not being said, we understand the meaning of what could not be said. Whether he meant it or not, Derrida's thoughts covered also the negative theology of Eastern faiths, where the importance lies in what is not rather than what is. By the way, if we're on religion, the Ten Commandments, seven of them refer to what not to do. Now let's look at reality from another angle. To wonder about where we are, we would need to consider where we are not. I am here and not there. Is the not there something something or is it somewhere in which way isn't where we are symbi sim symbiotically connected to where we are not after all 
one does not exist without the other. When it is, say, six o'clock, it's implicit that it is not, not every other possible time in the past or in the future. We are always relative to what is not. And where we, and where we are is always where we were, not, and where we will be. This is what makes each of us absolutely unique while always temporary. If everything is always temporary, reality itself is fleeting and thus cannot be reality. That's the very notion of reality goes poof. Um, the, um, just, I want to mention again, we, we, we did a whole um, Zoom on this, uh, that Robert Frost's poem, The Road Not Taken which is about the present, but is actually about the past event that did not happen. We need to ask whether there was ever a road that we did not take rather than the road that we're on now. What this comes down to is whether there is ever a decision that we do not make, a thought we do not have. On the face of it, this is a strange question. Intuitively, there are any number of decisions we could make and look, and looking back, any number of decisions we could have made. The point is, though, that once we are where we are, there isn't any decisions we did not make. I know many of you will not agree with that, but it so happens that it's 100% sure for me that I am here. Are you here? I was asked. Yes, of course I am. I'm always here as far as I'm concerned. R Ricky Gervais, who intersperses his stand-up comedy with serious spec speculative facts about life, brought up in one of his shows his insights into human existence. It's amazing to be alive, he said. The chances of being here as us, that sperm hitting that egg, is 400 trillion to one. It is incredible that we're here. Well, it so happens that it's 100% sure that we are here. When there is one in one chance, it's not a chance at all. Not only is 400 trillion to one chance of our being born a statistic seen from God's position, from a spot outside where we are not, but also where we could never have been. In sum, Gervais is asking the old philosophical question, why is there something rather than nothing? pondered over from earliest times, first in connection with God's, God and belief systems, and over a few hundred years over a question that Heidegger famously characterized as the most fundamental issue of philosophy. Um, it certainly is a strange question since it requires the answer to what would have happened if nothing had happened. In a personal context, it would be asking what would have happened if I had not been born? Or could I not have been born? That is, if the statistics of 400 trillion to one had not panned out, there is no answer to a question that cannot be posed for the reason that we can't be around to pose it. Why is the question, why is there something rather than nothing, is actually, why is there anything apart from us? But that does not have even the veneer of profoundness. If every, everything around us is part of what we are, of our thoughts, feelings, and very essence, the more we know, the more there is, not the less there is. Uh, author Tony Morrison criticized secularism for shrinking down human life to an exclusively biological scale. Life goes on off, after death, she believed but the dead affirm human life more than they transcend it or reject it. But this is from the perspective of, the still, of those still living. Those weren't just abstract propositions for her. In 2015, she told a reporter about a near-death experience she'd had decades earlier. I left my body and I was only eyes and my, mind, she reported. But, and I make this point over and over again, People forget that it is a near death experience and near and almost is not death, is it? Near death experiences are strange. One is either dead or alive. Near death is not death. A near marathon is not a marathon. A near passing grade is not a passing grade. We spend 
all our lives trying not to be not. The transhumanist project is one in which biological death ultimately no longer exists as a limit. Belief in a future of uploaded minds, but also by the interest of cryonics through which our individual bodies and their intelligences can be preserved. How are we doing with time? Not very well. But do we know what we don't know? No. An example would be an island you didn't know about until you read about it. Did the island exist for you till then? The answer would have to be that it didn't. The fact that it existed for other people does not abrogate the fact that you had no knowledge of it and thus it did not exist for you. If you insist that the island existed even when you didn't know of its existence at the time, you are infected with a case of retrospective foreknowledge, claiming to have known something before knowing it. When there is no one with memory in the world, there is no history, no dinosaurs. There wasn't anything because there isn't anything. That is, the absence of anyone for whom anything could be anything. Um, which brings me to the not in nothing. Okay, and it, uh, it, it is where, in my humble opinion, philosophers have failed. Simply not grasp what the not is or not. So I won't go th through it in detail, but uh, Arist Aristotle, Leibniz, Wittgenstein, Bertrand Russell, Quine, uh, went, went into it unsuccessfully. Let me mention two that some of you love. Uh, that's why I mention them always, because I don't. Um, Hegel and Sartre drove themselves and us crazy through their involved and endless diggings into nothing without distinguishing between the absence of something and the absence of everything, which I set out in my book, Nothing Matters. I presume most of you have read it, so you know what I wrote. But not, not is the equivalent of the absence of something, which I call nothingness. Not is not the equivalent of the absence of everything, which I call nothing. Not is the absence of a specific something, while nothingness is the notion of absence of anything. Hegel explored negation in his dialectical method, which involves the process of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Hegel's dialectic approach to understand reality and history involves the negation and reconsolidation of opposing concepts. Um, Sartre talked about conscience, etc. They would have saved themselves a lot of work had they realized that there are two knots, not something and not everything. And they got, they got themselves into extremely hot water because they're trying to explain something which is absolutely impossible the, the lack of everything, but trying to reconcile it with the absence of, of, of something. Um, there are no huge ontological or epistemic problems with a not something. Where there is something, there could be a not something, which as I say, I call nothingness. I distinguish between it's very important, not everything, which I call nothing. Now, here comes an important point, and I'm finishing now. Nothing, the absence of everything, is an epistemic void. And I did not mention that particular term in my book, by the way. Epistemic void does not describe a lack of knowledge or information about a particular subject or topic. While it would indicate that there are limits to human understanding, an epistemic void does not describe about which subject or topic there is no knowledge. It does, therefore, not describe the limits of human understanding, since to do so will be to describe what an epistemic void is. And neither is it a not, nor a not is. An epistemic void does not exist because there is a complete absence of an observer, and hence there isn't anyone that can refer to what isn't. Hang on, folks. I hope this is not a, this is not a Zoom to doze through, by the way. Um, so silence or empty space do not constitute epistemic voids, voids 
since there is always an observer of silence or of empty space. There is, in other words, no knowledge of what we don't know. Well, I could talk about the tree in the forest, but I won't. And, and since Terry is here, and I, I, I always have to mention AI, which I will again, AI, correct me if I'm wrong, needs to distinguish between objects and the absence of objects, right? But AI cannot complete the absence, you know, cannot contemplate the absence of everything, since that would include itself not existing. There's a bit of philosophy to feed to, the, to AI. An epistemic void does not solve anything, including the possible danger of AI, since there isn't anyone to do that solving or anyone to know this. There is no is, no non-is, in fact, no not. And in fact, no not about, there is no not everything. So I end with us hanging on the precipice of not and the abyss under that contemplation. That should have kept you awake, or the opposite, or not awake. So um, here we are, folks. I've done my bit, my not bit, I mean. And um, I see there are people waiting to talk. Uh, can, can, I, can I again, please, um, tr could you please try for five minutes? I don't insist on it, but if you could, because, because other people want to, want to come on and, and talk. So have at it. Michael. Uh, hi. So uh, I raise my hand uh, before you finish your uh, talking that I usually don't do, but uh, I have to leave at 11. Uh, and uh, I uh, wanted to point out uh, something about the psychological uh, origins uh, of our idea of not uh, and also the role of not uh, in computer science. Uh, that is probably related also to AI. Uh, so uh, what uh, we probably, uh, uh, what is uh, uh, the psychological basis of uh, what uh, we are talking uh, when something is not that, it is uh, always uh, related to a particular context. Uh, uh, and uh, we, later came to philosophical abstractions uh, when we are talking about uh, not existence of anything at all and so on. But uh, for our ancestors, uh, it was the matter of survival to differentiate uh, between something that uh, we can eat or we can not eat. Something which is dangerous or not dangerous. Uh, to differentiate between friend and enemy. Although I know that logically friend and enemy, enemy is not, not a friend, but anyway, this was uh, what was important for us. Uh, and um, uh, say to say that um, uh, orange is not an apple, uh, so uh, logically this is correct. But uh, what is, uh, could be more important that both are fruit. And what could be even more important that both we could eat uh, and not afraid that we uh, would be poisoned. And uh, so this is contextual nature of uh, this differentiation between something and not something. This is uh, very, very easy to lose or to miss. And uh, as you probably know, in computer science, uh, it's all based on binary, uh, zero and one, uh, and one is not zero. Which of them represents the truth? Uh, it's again context dependent, but uh, for implementation this in computer code, it does not matter. <laughs> all that matters is they are different and opposite. Uh, and you can define the logical operations on this, converting one to another with not operator and so on. That's all that you need to know. Uh, and uh, for AI, the challenge is uh, to grasp the idea of this context dependency. Because although these neural networks, they, they can kind of uh, like 
build the own ontologies or fill in the own ontologies and uh, derive them from this training data and so on. Uh, there is no guarantee that uh, the context uh, that they derive from the ontologies would be the same as uh, we humans uh, would, uh, would see. Yeah, and the ontologies uh, could uh, like logically be similar, but uh, with some subtle differences, uh, which uh, would not be immediately obvious, but once we or they, I mean they, AI systems, try to use the ontologies and apply them to uh, like real situations, uh, they could uh, be badly misleading or wrong or unacceptable for humans, and it could not be immediately obvious. So that's uh, another risk that uh, we can have uh, with this. Uh, but anyway, I guess my main point is uh, not to forget this context dependencies uh, when uh, we are talking about not or something is not that. And uh, a lot of disagreements between people probably could be attributed uh, to this fact uh, that uh, they apply the, this uh, uh, sharp differences uh, between truth and not truth, for instance, or false, uh, from one con context to another context. And uh, we are not always flexible enough to make this adjustment. Uh, for so let me stop at this. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. But uh, could... could uh... AI be so uh, intelligent that it could uh, consider itself not existing? I mean, uh, we, we can't, but, but could... Uh, I, uh, I guess logically this is possible, but I am not sure how would it uh, uh, apply this to the fact of its own existence, I mean, uh, in practical sense. So uh, it could uh, just consider this as uh, a logical or theoretical abstract concept, but uh, did not draw the same conclusions uh, as we humans do. So uh, I just cannot say. Okay. Uh, so Fair enough. You mentioned truth. Uh, you know, that, that always gets me to sit up. I'll get back to the truth later. Thank you, Michael. When, Thank you. When, I, when I'm talking about truth, uh, quotation marks apply. So uh, it's uh, truth in some logical sense, a logical context, but not absolute. So. Okay, so not is not necessarily absolute. Uh, no, it, it, it's, uh, I, I guess it's never absolute, but, but again, never should be seen in uh, this quotation mark. So, just, okay, fair enough. Thank, thank you very yes. much, Michael. Thank you. Josh, you're slowing down. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I have to. <laughs> um, I guess I'm following up on, on Michael uh, in terms of the focus on context dependency. Uh, I wanted to start quickly with your quote from Heidegger, the, uh, where he asked the question in his famous lecture, what is metaphysics? Why is there something rather than nothing? Well, 20 years after he uh, gave that lecture, he wrote an introduction to what is metaphysics, uh, in which he says, I was misunderstood for 20 years about what I meant by that. What he meant by that wasn't to, that we should begin with this question, this, this question which uh, is a classic metaphysical question. Why is there something rather than nothing and try to answer it or uh, either in the positive or the negative. But Heidegger's focus was on the is. Why is it that we only use the is with regard to something, but we don't use the is with regard to nothing. And what he meant by that was we overlook, we tend to think in terms of a kind of uh, uh, what he calls sort of an ordinary notion of time things uh, emerge, they linger for a while, and then they pass away. It's a sequential notion of time. Things are either present or they're absent, but they can't be both at the same time. And so people misread, according to that original notion of time, that, you know, his question, why is there something rather than nothing? Is if, you know, again, according to this sort of the sequential notion, well, there's either something or there's nothing, right? 
But what Heidegger was trying to get us to was a notion that the two are simultaneous within time. Let me put that differently. Um, so, um, Ron, you were uh, making the distinction about it that you, you lay out in your book between uh, nothing and uh, and the not, and the not is in, in reference to a specific uh, thing. And thing is sort of global. Um, and um, what I would say is that in order to, when we experience anything, any something, that something only makes sense, only has its meaning in, in relation to a not. And the not is context dependent. Uh, it, I mean, it's radically, it's more radically context dependent than I think that you would find within a, 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 a kind of a, a, you know, a, a, a more traditional logical propositional way of understanding uh, context dependency. What I mean is that if you think about the use of any word, if you were to ask somebody, if you're a psychotherapist and you're sitting with a client and the client is, you know, a, a bunch of, a, a flow of words is, is coming out of their mouth about some crisis in their life. And every word is meaningful to them, but you're trying to determine how it's meaningful to, to them, how every, what every word means to them because every word is dichotomous. That is to say, when they say, uh, I, I consider myself a good person, well, good for them in the context in which they mean it, uh, it, it only means what it means in relation to what it is not. And that not is context dependent too. That not belongs with, so it's not just that the not can't be defined or, or located in itself. The substantive thing can't be located in and of itself. We pretend that we do that all the time. And then we shunt off the not aside as some as some you know irascible, annoying kind of a, a, a negative or nihil that we don't know what to do with. Uh, whereas, so that we pretend that the something that the not is in some relation to can be fully defined by us outside of that not. But it, it, another way of thinking about the not is in terms of the past and the present. Any present. The words that are coming out of my mouth, it's present to present after present, it's a new a new now. Each new now is bringing with it its own unique, specific, context-dependent not uh, uh, or, or past. Josh, um, may, and may, the past, yeah. Go may ahead. I, may I in, uh, inter interject for a second? Yeah. I, I, I have no problem with that not. I have no problem with the absence of something. Heidegger did have a problem and he did not solve it. He used a, a lot of words, but when you use words, you are using words. And there is the absence of everything just isn't because you're there making the words. That's my problem. That that is that is the that is the point I'm trying to get across. There is no problem with not being things. We can put them into context. We can do what we want with them, but we can't do anything with nothing because we're not there to do it. That that's my point. Heidegger did not did not solve it, and uh, Hegel didn't solve it. However much somebody goes around and explains all sorts of flow of words, Hegel was there making his comment, and he 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 did he could not get through the fact that that there is no absence of everything. So. That that's my point. All right, well then, so, all right. So let me let me sort of adjust my comment to say this: that I don't believe that. I believe that whenever we try to make that distinction between the not and this context-dependent, absolutely necessary, not just adjunct, but it belongs to the meaning, whatever meaning we're involved in. Uh, whenever we think we we can make a distinction between that structure and, and something we call the nothing or the absolute or the global nothing. Well, we're we're simply moving on to another form of the not that the, that that nothing we think exists as as, as something distinct from the no. not doesn't. No, it, it simply as as soon as as soon as you put the we in there, that's it. You it, you're not you're not on the, the absence of everything anymore. As soon as you say we or I or it or anything, that's it. You're finished. You're 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 back to the original. No, nothing is the absence of something. The absence of everything includes us. If it doesn't, then it's the absence of everything apart from us. And that's not interesting at all. 
I agree that it's not. Not only that, I think it's what Wittgenstein would call a confusion of language, ah. that we're, we're confused about what we think we mean by it. <laughs> and all we need is some ther- Wittgensteinian therapy to get let the fly out of the fly bottle. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. You, you wouldn't go that far. <laughs> Thank you very much, right. Josh. Um, you'll, you'll, you'll come back. You'll, I know you will. Oh, of course. <laughs> oh, oh, see you soon. Right. Hi there, George. Can't see you or hear you. Hello, hello. Hi there, George. Yes. What I wanted to say to you and listen to you, and I want to engage you a bit on Hegel, because I think, I mean, I'm going to argue that you misunderstand Hegel. I mean, Hegel says that the beginning of philosophy, the very beginning of philosophy, is the realization of being and not being. Right? So in other words, philosophy exists when we understand that there is something that requires explanation, right? Now, what I'm going to say, one point I'm going to make about Hegel, it's very important to stress this, is that Hegel, like Kant, argued you could not philosophize about the infinity, which is to say, why is there being? We can't explain that. We can't philosophize. We can't engage it rationally. We cannot. Now, at the same time, what Hegel says is that what, and I'm going to focus on humans here, what happens in terms of understanding being is that we start to understand being when we understand not. So in other words, how do we know banana? Why do we understand banana? So you know what banana is not. And so even if we think about this example of the notion of the light being on, right? And we say either the light is on or it's off. And that's valid. However, when we're saying it's on, we're also saying it's not off. In other words, if the light bulb was just to be always on or never on, we would just say light bulb. But instead we say light bulb on or light bulb off. So in other words, the basis of knowledge is negation, is what the thing is not. And this is the basis of classification, and we build knowledge on this basis. So Hegel doesn't reject the idea of being, or indeed he says you cannot philosophize being as a totality. We can understand being, we can understand it because being is rational, laws of physics, right, the way that humans behave. You know, again, broadly speaking, it's rational, and we understand that rationality through negation by what it's not. So John is running. Why do we know he's running? Because we know what he looks like when he's walking. So he's not walking, he's running. And that's the role of not in Hegel. It's not the, it's, again, he rejects the idea that you can debate globally or try to explain why being is being, right? Again, this is true of both Hegel and Kant. So in other words, let me just conclude on this point, which is when you debate and discuss the infinity, why is there being? When does being end? You've left the realm of philosophy and now you're in the realm of theology for Hegel. And I think that's a, that's a very, very valid point I would submit. So we cannot explain why the laws of physics exist all we can really do is engage those laws and understand them ontologically. Same thing with human mind. We cannot understand why the mind exists. We can just engage it ontologically. But again, negation, the not, is indeed the key point in terms of understanding being. If there was no not, then being would just be one thing. There'd be no distinction. There'd be no truly understanding it. It would just be one thing. Can I ask, Sorry, you, go ahead. Can I ask you a question? Go ahead, go ahead please. Uh, is there such a thing as knowledge when there's nobody to have knowledge? Uh, well, I'm going to just, okay, let me answer it this way. Let me just no, answer this no, way. No, I just, well, let, let me I just want a yes or no. That's all. Well, like, well, I mean, I know you want a yes or no, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer your question this way. Can I please allow me? Just indulge me for a moment, please. Okay. What, I'm, what, what Hegel says, the, the point that Hegel makes, is that there is just being, right? Without humans and negation, there's just being. Where is that? And so, say, I'm sorry? Where is that? I'm not sure what you're, what the polls asking your you're question. You're talking about polls. being. What, what, being of what? In other words, the world is, right? So, so yeah, yeah, wait, wait but, but how do we, how do you know the world is? Who, who sees the world is? If there is nobody around, the world isn't. It's not even isn't. I mean, think of it. You've got, you've got to get past, possible. you've got to get past the business of the absence of something because you're there to see the absence. If you're not there to see an absence or there to see anything, you're not there. There's no knowledge. There's no not. There, there's no Zoom now. There just isn't. 
And there's no way of, it, of, of, of going around it by using fancy words about being, when as soon as you use the word being, you're actually using the word being. I'm telling you to use the word being without being being. And you can't. That's, that's my can. point. I, I can't. If I, you I can, can then you're not talking about the same thing. Well, and let me respond to your argument, if you will, first. First and foremost, in that, that formulation is very solipsistic, right? Because ultimately, this is the, the, the David Hume conundrum, right? Which is, I only know, knowledge, to, knowledge no. is only what I see no, and see, hear no. and see at the same time. As soon let me finish. You, let me finish. No, as soon as you say me, I, that's the end of it. All right, but let me, at least allow me to respond. I'm allow yeah, me to develop an argument, to deepen the conversation. I don't know, I, I, I don't know sure exactly what you're aiming for, so I'm trying to answer to you, giving you an answer that is analytical and I think constructive. Let me say this. So, you know, Hume, again, let me see very quickly. Hume says, we only know what's in front of us. Of course, Kant comes back and says, look, there are classes of objects, right? So there's chair in the world, right? You, you know, there's a chair in front of you, but there's a little chair in the world. And then, so then what, what, and then Hegel again, and so Hegel comes back, right? And says, look, there's spirit. So spirit does begin prior to us because we are the function of spirit. We are the function of ecology. You cannot, it seems to be illogical to say that things do not exist. There was not being before us because we are a function and product of being. If there's no being, there'd be no us. I don't know where you're coming from because you are the one who's coming and therefore, therefore your whole argument doesn't stand because you're the one making it. You've got to make an well, argument yeah. and, and not exist. Try that. But let me ask, let me add, let me add this other point, which I think is quite Quinian, but nonetheless, I mean, there's a fossil record that tells us that us. there was being before we existed. Yes, telling us. Now you don't yes. exist. Can you tell that to a dead person? Would the would the dead person know what you're just saying? I guess I don't really understand what you're I mean, to say just because I'm dead. Doesn't mean the world doesn't exist beyond my uh, beyond my beyond my uh, life. For a dead person, the world does not exist. Sorry. But wait a second here, because ultimately, what you're trying to reduce knowledge to is individual psychology, <sighs> and that's the problem. I mean, again, it's a solipsistic view of the world. Well, it's just to say, no. only the world that I see <laughs> exists at the moment that I see it. Otherwise, no. it doesn't exist. No, if I if I'm dead, there's no world for me. Right? That's it. That that, that that's okay, it. But that's the problem. But again, this is the issue. You're saying for me, for me. Well, and I'm, who, what I'm who saying else? is, who else? Well, because well, there has to be. The, I mean, I ah, there has to be. Maybe I'm wrong. Ah. Let me say this. I presuppose again. I, 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 and I think that people are listening understand what I'm saying. I presuppose because <laughs> I doubt this, it. there's a world beyond me, right? Oh. That, that's why I leave the room. Indeed, you know, that's <laughs> the way. Forgive me for saying this, but okay. toddlers, repu infants, re reputedly reason this way. When they leave the room, the room that they left. No, is no, no. no there. That's not what and, I'm talking about, and you know it. Uh, it's not what I'm talking no, about. You know, know, know that's not what I'm talking saying. about. No, 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 no. Because no. you're reducing it. You're reducing no. it to an individual awareness. No, 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 no. I'm not. I'm not. If if there if there is if there's not a single person in the world, not one single person, does the world exist? It, well, in that the way you're pausing it, yes, the world exists because you're saying it. For whom? You're saying the world exactly. You're well saying. done. Well done. Thank you. Uh, we'll, Thank you, sir. We'll come back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Uh, Kerry, <laughs> good to well, see that, you. Good to see you, too. That was that was very entertaining, and I can tell this is going to be a great conversation. I'm sweating here. All right. So <laughs> this this should be short. I mean, this is, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to go too in-depth on this because it's such a, you know, basic fundamental stuff, but it is difficult. So I'm going to make a statement that I think is problematic. The concept of not does not correspond to anything in the universe. At one level, I can say I think that's a true statement. But at the other hand, I, I see there being problems with it because I'm using the term right? Not does not correspond to anything that's in the universe. And I understand what you're saying to George. It's the idea, does, does the world exist for my imaginary friend? 
And I think that this is where we get, I'm going to bring in some Wittgenstein because I have to, it's the law, <laughs> is that there's, you know, we have linguistic elasticity and the ability to create what I'm going to call conjunctive nonsense, right? The square circle. And at, at, at the ultimate extension of language, I'm not sure reality cares about our logical inferences. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, when we say, you know, existence doesn't exist as a concept without a perceiver. And by that, what I think we're getting to is that outside of perception, the concept of anything or any not thing becomes meaningless, right? It is the Wittgensteinian idea of, you know, that which you cannot speak of, you got to just keep your mouth shut, right? What does it mean? Like, I mean, you hit on it, I think the nail on the head. What does not time mean? There, there's not much you can say about it, right? What, what does non-existence mean? There's nobody there to to wax poetic about the topic. Um, now, whether not is anything other than just a logical construction, that might be might be somewhere we can get some traction. But uh, anyway, thank you for the topic. This is this is totally entertaining. <laughs> it, it's only entertaining when when we're when we're into when we're being entertained if nobody's being entertained there's no entertainment well i'm entertained so at least okay there's... fair enough in that case you have proven you exist thank okay. you <laughs> i hope you feel better now thank you very much curry I, am, I i feel very validated thank you. <laughs> good that's that's what we're here for roland hi hi okay well interesting conversation um, I suppose I, I like to uh, start with the uh, notion of how we recognize not, because I think it's fundamentally different from how we recognize anything else. And in that sense, I can see um, something in what Kerry's uh, little statement refers to. Um, so um, I like to try and reduce things to practical experiences that anyone can have a go at. So to me, if I am, for example, looking for something uh, in a room, say I'm looking for my glasses, which happen to be perched up here, but I'm looking for my glasses and I find them. Oh, there we are. I found my glasses. Great. Then I look for my, say another occasion, I look for my glasses. I can't find them anywhere. So I say, oh, no, my glasses are not in this room. Now I can apply the same basic framework to anything. So I can look at an object and say, ah, that is a cup. Or I can look at an object and say, no, it's not a cup. But in each occasion, the same basic thing seems to me to be happening. When I notice that something is, there is an event of recognition. So I find my glasses. Yes, there they are. I see a cup. Yeah, that's a cup. There's something is happening in way of what I might call a landing on it. I recognize something. <clears throat> But consider what happens when we are um, failing to find something. I don't find my glasses. Do I find not glasses? No. What happens instead is I give up looking. If I look at a cup uh, and say, this is a teapot, I might for a few milliseconds uh, stare at it and say, how can this be a teapot? And then I give up and say, no, that's not. I cannot recognize that as a cup. So the key point I'm making here is that when we actually recognize something, there is a quality of experience that involves landing on it, as it were. It's very, very hard to describe it, but there is a definite quality of experience that involves locking on and going, yes. But when we can't find something, when we experience not, we don't get that. What happens instead is we try to get it and then we give up. So the experience of saying, no, that's not, is actually the experience of recognizing that we've given up looking. Now, um, I don't know how that ties in with what Kerry said. Uh, it sounds like it's probably similar, but it's expressed in different words. 
But I think if one tries that experiment oneself on anything, you know, you can look around your room and say, is there an elephant here? Well, for a few seconds, you might go, is there? And then you'll go, well, I'm not going to bother to look anymore because I don't think there is. So it's the failing to find that we recognize as not. And so this is a qualitatively completely different thing from finding something, from landing on it. And I think that difference is extremely significant. What it does is it kind of, it puts not into a completely different context. It, it, it emphasizes that when we are uh, looking for and identifying things, whether they're objects or thoughts or feelings or whatever it happens to be, we're actually looking for patterns of some kind. And we're looking to see whether our experience in the present of whatever it is, my visual experience corresponds to seeing a cup. Uh, when we can't get that recognition, we don't lock on as it were, and then we give up trying, at that point, we are going, no, I can't see it. So um, that's, that's one of the first things I want to say. The second thing I want to say is also connected with what Kerry uh, observed, which was concerning the square circle, which is one of my favorite um, little constructions. Um, I think there are two ways of um, identifying not, and it all comes down to the event of recognition. And therefore, behind that, it comes down to something Ron has been pushing uh, continuously, which is it's got to be something recognizing it. There must be a recognizer for there to be a recognition. And if there's no recognizer, how can there possibly be a recognition? So let's assume that there is a recognizer and we are now looking for an event of recognition. So there are two ways in which we can see in which we can see the idea of not here. The first way is the one I've talked about, which is we look for something and we can't find it and we give up. And therefore we say, no, we can't find that. But the other way is actually where one doesn't even have to look. So if you start with a set of conditions that your search um, is um, going to uh, be based on, and that set of conditions contains mutually exclusive simultaneous requirements, then you don't even have to look. So for example, I can say, I wonder if there is an unfindable object in this room. Well, I don't even have to start looking because I can already predict before I start looking that the event of finding is impossible. Because I, if I, the moment I find something, it cannot be the thing I'm looking for because it's defined as unfindable. Uh, the same idea we can apply to the square circle because the object a square and the object a circle are fundamentally different. There is no possibility at all that however hard I look, I will ever have an event of recognition of something that is both, that satisfies both of those sets of conditions. So before I even start looking, I can go, that's impossible. That is not possible to occur. But the interesting thing about it, as Kerry, I can't remember the term Kerry used. It was quite a good term when you referred to the square circle. It was basically about the idea of taking two sets of concepts and combining them into a single thing. But it isn't Conjunctive thing. nonsense? Conjunctive nonsense. That's the word. Thank you very much. Um, so that idea of bringing sets of criteria together that actually cannot resolve to anything uh, is what I'm talking about there. Where you, and and the, the, the basic, uh, in fact, there was a point some years ago when I recognized this and I called this, this idea of looking at those conditions my primary drivel filter. So if you look at an argument that someone is raising and you can see within it that the event that must occur for that mm. to be recognized um, must both happen and not happen at the same time, then you know that there's drivel in the air here. It can't happen. Um, this is also one of the, I mean, it's a very powerful tool, I think, I think this. If you actually analyze the conditions that are the subject of a claim and look for uh, simultaneous 
mutually exclusive conditions, then you can instantly eliminate it as being nonsense. And this is one, of, I think, one of the things that uh, Ron is bringing out here and possibly is quite unpleasant to hear is the fact that in order to make any recognition at all of anything, in order to have any knowledge, there must be someone knowing it. There must be someone recognizing it. And therefore, the individual or consciousness or whatever you might call it that recognizes has to be right at the center. And if you then have a proposition that excludes that fundamental recognizer, you've got nonsense instantly. You've instantly got what well, that wonderful term that Kerry just used, which I've forgotten again. <laughs> Come on, what is it, Kerry? <laughs> conjunctive nonsense. Conjunctive nonsense, yeah, okay. So you've got conjunctive nonsense where you have a claim for something to happen, but no observer there. Anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much, Ron. I, I just uh, need to cross swords with you on one. Oh. Uh, well, this is normal, but on, on, on the way you started, you, you said um, you're looking for your glasses and you don't find them. And uh, do we find not glasses? And I say, yes, we do. And I, I say, uh, do we, when there's silence, do we, do we find... Do we find not sound? Yes, we do. And that that that's my that's my point about the absence of something, because we I think Kerry I think also Kerry mentioned this, that 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 you assume that when you find something, it's compared to the to the not finding. Is that that more or less what you said, Kerry? Yes, that that exists. Was it you? That 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 or maybe it was Yeah, I don't well, think that was me. Okay. Well. You're being blamed for everything today, Kerry. Uh, but so I, I, I think I think that yes, that when we when we have silence, and we look for sound, we we find, we find not we find not sound, and and you do find not glasses. So not in that way is an is. It's an is not. You found the is. I, that that's the way I that's the way I, I have always thought of it. That there's the. I, you know what I, I, I mean. Suppose. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting what you mean. I guess that comes down to the question of whether failing to find something is the same as recognizing not it. And I'm not sure whether that is the case. Um, okay, that would be an interesting thing to think about. Because, yeah, it's a good point. Uh, to me, if I, if I don't find my glasses, I don't go, oh, I have found an instance of not glasses. That, that's just, that's strained. I would say... Damn, I can't find my glasses. <laughs> um, it's a, I, I've, I failed to find. So okay. I have identified a failure to find. Um, but you found a not. Yeah, the, 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 the trouble is that the, there, I think there is, a, the, there is a qualitative difference because when I find, when I identify something, it's, it, the, the, there is a... Oh, it's, it's it's so hard to describe it. It's there is like a sense of integration around it, a feeling of of solidity, as it were. When I can't find something, it's much more provisional. For example, I could look around the room and say, "I can't find my glasses." Oh well. But then someone else can say, "Well, here they are." Oh, suddenly they're there. So it, uh, the 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 failing to find feels a lot more provisional than finding something where it's right there. Okay, so that's very I can't interesting. I don't necessarily see whether they're quite the same. They they seem slightly different. I agree, but thank you very much, Ryan. Um, cool. first of all, I do want to say that I'm very very pleased to see young young people with us. One very young, and two not so young. And I think it's very nice that they've ah there you are, and it's very nice that they heard about it and they're attracted by it, and it's it's a very good thing. So it um. Bill, do you mind if I move on to on to Samuel? It might be near his bedtime. I have no idea. Is it okay with you? Because he hasn't been here. Nice to come back. Yeah. Okay. Samuel, thank you for coming. Thank you. So it's a bit like what Roland said. So let's say you're in a room and there are loads of objects that you have never seen before, and someone asks you to find 
a scoreboard and you have no idea what it is, you randomly pick up an object and it turns out that that is the right one, but you don't know. Have you actually found the object? Because from your perspective, you have no idea what you found. And from the person who's told you perspective, you have found the right thing. So have you actually found it? Oh, that's a good one. Ronnie, you going to answer that? Oh, I don't exactly oh. exactly know how to answer it because... No, no, no. I'm, no, you asked it very, very well. I think you asked Roland. Roland, oh, do you right. want to... Do you want to answer yeah, yeah. that one? I, I, Thank you I, very I, I much, Samuel. Answer. Very, very, very good question. It's a really good question. And it's the sort of question that I really like because it's one that you can really, uh, it's a practical question that you can really think about. And I would reduce it to the question of, well, what are the events happening? So I pick up the object and unknown to me, it's a squabble, uh, but someone else knows it's a squabble. So when I pick it up, I can't recognize it as a squabble because I don't know. So for me, there is no event of recognition. But the other person who might have set the examples in the room who does know there's a squabble there and sees me pick it up will be able to go, ha ha, he's found the squabble. So he would recognize it, but I wouldn't. That's, what I, that's how I would answer that. So yeah, but does that help? But I've got it. We've got another question. So there, so, so there's two people. So the person who knows what the squabble is, and the person who doesn't know, which opinion matters more? Which opinion means it? Because you can't have something that is and isn't a squabble at the same time. So whose opinion is is and whose is not? Is that is that to me as well? You're asking. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Well, um, I think you can have something being a squabble and not a squabble at the same time, because two people um, may well see it from different points of view. So, um, uh, I mean, to give you an example, um, someone could play me a piece of music and I could say, that's fantastic. But you might hear it and go, that's trash. That's awful. So, that there we have two different opinions on the, apparently the same thing, although it's not no. still. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I would say um, I would say that it's not possible to uh, to say from the outside which of those judgments matters most. I think it would matter. It, it really depends upon what the individual people want to do with the squabble in the first place. You know, if I'm desperate for a squabble and I can't find one, then it might be matter a lot. <laughs> okay that's very good uh so, so samuel um if if there was um if there were aliens that we didn't recognize that were aliens uh how would we even know they were aliens i mean they were around they might be here in this uh in this zoom meeting i mean I, i'm sure some are by the way but uh but i mean what well, how would we know I mean, we've never seen an alien, ever. What they show us on films is always a combination of things that we've seen. But we've never seen anything we haven't seen that we don't recognize. How could we recognize something we've never recognized? That's, that would be part of, I think, part of your question, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Samuel. Stick around. There, there's, there's, more, there's more coming. Um, Bill? And then after that, if it's okay with you, Frank, I can go to Tim because he's never been on before. Is that all right with you? Well, I can pass my saying my rights to Tim. Is that it? No, 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 no. You you are on now. I'm asking Frank if he if he'll give his turn to Tim temporarily. You you're okay, Bill. You're on. Oh, I'm on. Okay, you're on. I'm sitting here and asking myself, don't we narrate our perceptions and our thoughts? We are the author of those, right? And I hear that the argument here is that our authorship, if you will, our perceptions of those ideas are exclusive to us, really. And we can share them in conversation and language. But what I'm saying to you also is that I don't know that there's any counterpart or correlation 
with something called reality with those thoughts. So the question of whether there is anything beyond our thoughts and perceptions is a question of solipsism, right? So we have to ask the question, well, what, 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 what is going on here in this idea of context dependency and mind dependency? And I think that was the idea that Kant really went to and Wittgenstein certainly did in his definition in the second book. But it seems to me that we're talking about a situation where we have limits to our ability to narrate. And I think that's Ron's point, that we cannot get beyond our ability to narrate. And we can't get beyond our sense of perception. And we always articulate what we know and what we think in terms of us now narrating. And there's no ability to get beyond our narrating capability. In other words, there are brackets and boundaries to our consequences and our consciousness. Now, it seems to me the idea of not is far bigger than this, this context of philosophical rambling, because we have all kinds of questions. My property and your property is very clear. What's mine is not yours. And that's a fundamental issue. And being and non-being, as was said, is an important metaphysical question. And my life in in is in, in Monterey is not the same as your life in New York. It's different. It's not the same. So the idea of same and difference, and distinction and difference, and similarity and difference are critical kinds of language games that we play with each other, and each other is in name, and very importantly, a language uh, that we all share and we can communicate with each other. So I'm certainly kind of interested in this idea of narration as authorship of our lives and how we can get beyond it if we can. And I suggest that in the context of being an author, we make decisions and distinctions and difference, use not, not. We come up with puzzles like Samuel has. And those questions are all within the racket of our consciousness. But at the same time, we come up with a limit of our ability to talk about the world. And that gets us back to Tractatus. Can you talk about something you can't talk about? I don't know. That seems to be a contradiction. I don't know. Anyway, there you are. Thank you very much, William. I, 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 I agree with you that, that, that we are, as, as the film said, we're all individuals. And, um, and, and I think that is, that is the basis. I, I think that's it. And I don't think it's a matter of language game games. I really don't. I think there's something really, really basic about the way each of us looks at the world and each of us looks at the world differently. But but um, as a commonality, we look we look at the world in a way that we humans can understand it within the context that each one each one of us sees it. We have to. We're at different spaces in time, and right. lo and location. We we have to look at things from different angles. No matter how close physically even we are to somebody, we're still looking at things. Even when you stand on somebody's head, we're still looking at things from a different position. And I think that's very, very fun, fundamental. Is that, and I, I, not I, me, Ron? Pardon? Is that the same as saying you are not me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's where that's that's, that. that's where not is very fundamental. Yes, I agree with you. But right. I don't I don't uh the, it's not language games. It sounds as though we're I really use that as a loose slur. Yeah, okay, of... okay, fair enough. I think it's you. important that you have a discourse that makes a difference. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Frank, now I'm going to hand over to Tim. That's okay with you, yes? Thank you very much, Frank. Thank you. Tim, welcome, welcome to our little chats, as it were. Thank you very much. Very interesting. And mine, as luck would have it, it's sort of a follow-on to what you were just talking about. So I kind of take a Wittgensteinian view of this whole issue, I guess, in thinking that not is just an artifact of language. So from the, this is something that's played up in Russell and Quine, which you mentioned briefly, but I don't think you really said much deeper about this, but, you know, Quine and Carnap and some others um, have, just seen some of the confusions about nothing and nothingness 
to be a confusions about language mm-hmm. and when you've actually taken not to be not the name of something but merely a logical connective you just take a sentence and then negate it right so that's all that not really is is a logical feature of language sort of a categorization as was talked about here earlier right you put things in a particular category and then you say that thing does not exist for instance quine wrote a paper called on what there is and there he argued how you could how mm-hmm. you know people might think that they're committed to pegasus existing when they use a sentence like pegasus you know was jason's flying horse and he basically took it and took the sentence put it down to its logical roots and said all you do is you say there exists an x that's a flying horse that jason owned and then you negate it and that's all not really means in that context so i'm not sure whether some of the confusions of you know what if i did not exist can be cleared up by just writing them out in logic and then negating me or what if the world did not exist well you've got a set of things there's a set of things that's everything in the world and then you put a negation in front of it and that's all we mean when we say what if the world did not exist thank you tim i i got i've got to get back i've got to back, get back to you on this because um as soon as, as soon as you talk about not you're talking about not and as soon as you say nothing nothing there is nothing that exists you are saying it therefore that's not the nothing i'm talking about you cannot use but because if you use but you're there to use it so you can you can write you can write out all all the all the words you want and then put a but in it but you're the one who's doing it and that that's the point i'm making it's got nothing to do with language because if i had to explain what the absence of everything is, I would not be able to do it because the the point that I'm doing it completely, I'm shooting myself in the foot by actually talking about it because I can't. I can only do it when, when I exist. I can't do it when I not exist. It's not a matter of language, not that part. And that the, that's the point I'm fighting everybody about because it's very difficult to imagine you being dead. It's impossible to imagine being dead. Is it possible to imagine oh, somebody can. else? No. <laughs> what do you mean it's impossible to it's imagine in... I'm dead? No, it's I impossible. Can, I can imagine. I can imagine that quite often. No. Yeah, but you can't. Yeah, but, yeah, but you, you're actually imagining. When you imagine, you're actually imagining. To, to, to not imagine means you're not. When you're dead, you won't imagine anything. That's the point. You can't come then and tell me I imagined it, in which case you were there to have imagined it. That that's That's my point about there being the non-existence of you, of everything, which includes you. That, Can I that's... imagine myself being a different person? Yes. I guess not on your view. No, yes, you can. Why not? You're, you're in existence. Imagine okay. yourself not existing. I can uh, imagine myself being my wife. Yes, fair enough. And then me being dead. No. Her imagining me being dead. Ah, her imagining you being dead is something different. <laughs> but you imagining yourself being dead, you can't do. That, that's, that's my point. See, think I think it's a confusion about language. No, there's but no there language. There's only a language when you're there to use language. If you're not there to use language, there's no confusion in language because you, you haven't but used language it. Language is separate from me. Well, well, you're actually using it now. Language is a public thing. Okay. Anyway, you can move okay, on. Okay, thank you very much, Tim. Very interesting. Frank, thank you for waiting. Uh, sure, uh, no problem. Um, a lot of uh, things i'm uh, going um a bit back to uh, roland um the um, notion of um uh, uh finding uh, looking for something not finding it and then giving up um you know similarly the thought of you know, the other reason why you would stop looking for something is you know when you do find it uh, you know the reason why i was thinking about that was um you know again 
you know, I appreciate Roland that you're talking about practical things. So, you know, I I like the um, uh, notion of you know trying to solve real problems and uh, seeing how I can get help with that. So, you know, I've been uh, struggling with the notion of our the current culture wars, uh, understanding how that's inevitable. You know, as um, cultures define identities, identities have uh, differences. The world provides different selection pressures. Some identities succeed better than others. They tend to dominate. That kind of leads towards, you know, some kind of unification. You know, I, uh, one of the phrases that I like um, is... Um, you know, Flannery O'Connor, a Catholic uh, novelist, uh, who talks about all that rises must converge, um, which is kind of interesting from a, an is and not perspective. Um, and it also kind of leads, um, kind of ties in with, uh, you know, the next level of, you know, evolution. So we got, you know, biological evolution, which takes a long time. That gave got us to a point where our ability to learn from each other really expedited evolution by cultural evolution. And, you know, there's a, a, a guy, Nick Bostrom, um, who's a, a philosopher, a, and one of the topics he took on was artificial intelligence. And he talks about the next level of evolution, about how artificial intelligences, you know, will eventually converge into one. He makes a good case for why at the end of the day, you know, uh, artificial intelligences, because of genetic algorithms, you know, the, um, how artificial intelligences are designed to compete with each other, to absorb the best parts of each other, and then to eventually assimilate that so that the ex extrapolation is that there will eventually only be one. So if you're that artificial intelligence that says, oh, there's a not me out there, there's a not me that's different than me, it has some benefits and some pluses, I'm going to kill the things that are, that are not uh, benefits, and I'm, I'm going to absorb the things that are benefits so that that not me will become me. You know, is the extension, you know, is, uh, is this where we get to what, Ron, what you were talking about, uh, converging on a concept like time where there eventually is no not. Suppose that, you know, I am that artificial intelligence that essentially just absorbs all of the not me's. Now, I'm not saying that there's nothing then, right? Although that that is possible. You know, if I just uh, see that I'm looking for the not me's, Whenever I see a not me, I absorb it or kill it so that it only becomes me. Is that going down the path of something like something that cannot have a not? Um, just, just out of curiosity. I'm you know, curious about that because I'm wondering where our current culture wars will end up. Will we become one large society so that there will not be another that we can other? You know, um, and, you know, does artificial intelligence, which goes through the same method of evolution, only at a much faster pace, is that something that can, you know, help us to understand where we're eventually going to head towards? And is that eventual, that place we're going to head towards, the elimination of the not me? Uh, just a question. Oh, very interesting. I think we all have to think about that. Very nice, uh, Frank. It's, a, it's an interesting point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dominic, good, hey. good to have you back. Same. Yeah, thanks for always being so welcoming. Um, I have a couple of points, and um, I try to parse through them, so um, I give my best. I'm not saying I have it all worked out. Um, I would maybe start by saying that I probably I would suggest that the not me and the sort of the negative and the positive me they are both all me. It's all me. So I would suggest my notness in other places and times 
is also me. So that's one way I would think about it. And um, the reason why I think that's one way to think about it is that we, in our human perspective, um, quantize the world, right? We have concepts of objects with boundaries. And from this kind of deeply innate way of thinking comes the whole binary situation, okay? I would uh, posit that actual, in actuality, or let's say on a deeper level, that uh, there is sort of only one thing, the end, right? Now, is that really just my fantasy here? I tell you, in what could tell us that this is actually the case? If you look over to, um, I think, like quantum physics, quantum me mechanics, etc., there is a way where I think you can, it's difficult to use terms here, but look at the world in which all the possible states um, sort of add up to nothing, okay? So um, that in, in a sense, there's sort of a perspective onto the world where it's sort of stepping out of the world, just in, hypo hypothetically, where if you sort of look down at the world, all the states add up such that there's no output at all. So it's sort of total equilibrium. It is only when you are sort of entering the perspective of being within that you start to sort of dividing the wholeness into quanti. But that is just a matter of perspective, right? Instead, probably, and then you could discuss what is bottom layer reality here, because that's an infinite discussion, but, um, I, and uh, anyone jump in or correct me if I'm wrong, but there is a way in quantum physics of saying that in some sense, just all these given states just add up to zero. So what does that mean? That as we speak here and talk here and seem to be in mo motion and process, there is a, an actual perspective on the world where actually right now nothing is happening. <laughs> and that's what you need to digest. But this perspective onto the world is out there and that's where your absolute nothing sits okay mm. and then with that say it cut me off because i have so many people just cut me off it's too long talking about the square circle is not nonsense it's just an undecided state of a system so basically you could say that the square circle the square and the circle are in quantum superposition and uh, these mathemat these states are very very well described, right? We we took and that's something that I have not just invented. You can go and read about that. The square and the circle is in quantum superposition. Now, do things that are in quantum superposition. These are all the possibilities of states and collapse of the wave function, and then you go. It's over there, right? Classically, then speaking, um, is the state of the square and the circle being in superposition? Uh, state of existence if it is the square the circle the circled square or the squared circle does exist it's just in superposition what does that mean you are describing with the squared circle um, a, a, a part of the system that is not decided yet and that this actually is also not my invention is you can look over at i think it's called intuitive mathematics or intuitional mathematics and intuitional mathematics actually actually works with a logical state of something being undecided and tries to build a whole axiom, axiomatic mathematic system with that state. So I could go on, but it's super exciting. I just put it on the plate. Again, I haven't worked it all out, but maybe these are pointers that offer some kind of ways of thinking about that. Thank you very much, Dominic. My question would have to be that if you are looking, if uh, before you find your particle or whatever, before you find it, does it exist? 
or does it exist or, or, or is it is it a not until you find it that that's a, that's the sort of question that's always, that's always bo bothered me when does it exist when you find it or before you before you find it and you just don't know where it is if you don't know where it is is it that's I think I think there's a way of talking about the quantum of light saying I think a lot of physicists say it's sort of sp spread out over the entire reality. So well, la quantum of light somehow in some sense is everywhere at all times. <laughs> it, don't ask me what that means, but there's some hardcore physicists who will tell you that that in some sense it's just everywhere at all times. Yeah, well, physicists say a lot of stuff, but it doesn't mean that, that we have to sort of agree with it all, or even some of it. But anyway, thank you very much, Dominic. Very, very interesting. Thank you. Richard, you've been extremely uh, patient. No, I can't hear you. Richard? Sorry, I muted so that okay. no sounds came in. Okay, uh, I hope that I'm not jumping ahead of anybody else who is really ahead of me. Um, I'm sorry I came in late. I had some difficulty getting on board until you sent me the code. Uh, I don't know why. It doesn't normally happen. No. Anyway, um, I feel that there's a problem here. Uh, really? It's a, a dichotomy uh, between common sense language and common sense understanding of were reality, if you like, reality in inverted commas, obviously, um, and the way that we're talking about um, not and nothingness and being, which goes towards the ideal. And I know you're anti-idealism, but uh, it seems to me we are, look, as a, a sort of neo-logical positivist, a logical positivist, if I could be, I find it very difficult to go into these areas that um, go beyond everyday uh, language and everyday common sense and reality. Uh, but if I look at not, I can see not in two main ways, possibly three. There's a logical not, where I know exactly what it means. Although using not in electronics, I can actually build almost everything. You're just using not gates. So basically not becomes incredibly important in constructing something that is. Uh, it's quite often used because it's cheaper to use not gates rather than uh, use different truth tables to construct different gates. Anyway, going apart from logic, I can say in normal language, this is not, or that is not. But we're not talking about not in that way. And yet, if we go into not, as in the way you're talking about, even in Greek philosophy, through Pyrrho, they brought back the idea of the Buddhist knot, of the Madhyamaka knot. And I know you hate Buddhism and hate going into um, Indian philosophy because it is impossible to extricate philosophy from religion in um, things like Buddhism and Hinduism and Nagarjuna and Shankara. We are talking about, to me, we exist somewhere between not and is, between chaos and order. And our existence is not, in the way that you say, something that you can define. And the problem with it is, and I know that you also dislike me going on about language, but the problem is language. <laughs> because our language cannot actually go into this. And I'm sorry I've gone back and I've been very simplistic and I've left out references to Aristotle who talked about it and to Lowe's, Hegel, uh, Wittgenstein, uh, Heidegger, all of whom have gone into this. But I tend to think that probably this whole thing is impossible to discuss because the language we use just can't do it but it could be that my brain just can't do it no no and i will leave it at that 
I think uh, the fact that language can't do it shows something, shows something very, very basic about language, or actually ab about about us. The language language should, according to Chomsky, anyway, uh, should be able to express anything you want to express. If it if it can't, as Wittgenstein would love love to say, then there's something wrong. And the, and what is wrong is using language as a, as a crutch for not being able to say things. That's my personal it's naughty, naughty brain, opinion. Well, you know that I've put forward the idea before that our brains are molded by language rather than language molded by our brains. But basically, someone um, referred to the idea that you can't think about something that's outside your sphere. You went into parallax about how we all build up a sort of Venn diagram, but yeah. we're all in different areas and we see something differently. Yeah. And the problem is language means something different to every person. Okay. And, and when we're talking about something which, if you, if you want to put it in a Plato scale, we're talking about the idealistic view of reality rather than common sense reality. We're talking about something that's beyond our brains as such. Um, but we struggle because we want to reach it. And without going into religion, which both you and I tend to disregard, um, it's difficult to pin it down in analytical philosophy. Correct. So I don't, and, like, so I don't like analytical philosophy. But there there's it. no philosophy without it being analysis. Well, without okay. the world is either rational or it doesn't exist in my mind. Okay, fair enough. It's open to religion and it's open to all the people who go into all sorts of superstitions. Um, and you would have to start thinking that uh, those mystics uh, do actually have reality. It is possible that for survival, the human brain restricts what it can sense and what it can think about because it takes too long if we're pondering the universe the lion's eaten us by the time we realize it's there and it's possible that our brains are restricted in their scope if it's but, a matter I mean, i'm not an expert in that i'm not if it's a matter of speed then then ai has got us beaten because they'll reach it Long, 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 long. AI hasn't can. got consciousness, and AI. Well, AI people. I've I've said this before. Um, my view is that the trouble is we all have different definitions of AI as well. And to me, a lot of people when they define AI, it's not what I was researching when I was trying to do it. But I was only work, working on one area, which is language processing. Um, physicists work on different areas, but I mean, there's an awful lot that's more. Um, of a charlatan's boast of AI than um, real AI. A computer is building on scripts and on past information that's been fed to it. It's a lot of it's just programming. Uh, okay. A lot of it's just, it, it's not actually, well, we'll I, I suspect to, biological we'll to, computing we'll may to, come into it. We'll have to leave, that's a very big topic. We'll have to leave that for another time. Thank you very much, Richard. Very, very, very interesting. Very interesting. Thank you. Going to move on to Anton. Now you've been very patient as well. Welcome back. Hello, and thank you. Um, so I, I'll point out like, um, and it's been pointed out before about um, the binary view, which I guess people have different views of that, of is and not. Uh, because I'll point out something that I think this ties in with what Dominic was saying, part of what Dominic was saying, but um, when we're recognizing something is, it's conceptual, if nothing else. Like whether or not it, it exists may or may not be the case, but it's conceptual, if nothing else. Um, and when something is not, it's divine, it's defined compared to what is. But I don't think that this is strictly um, binary, which is why I brought up the point about um, things being seen as binary. There's definitely nuance. There's definitely uh, complexity. But um, the thing is, is that when we're using the, even when you have an idea of what something is not, it's always a distinction. Like whether we're seeing it as an opposite of something else or whether we're just seeing it as distinct from something else, it's just always 
um, implying or suggesting that we're seeing or seem to be seeing some sort of distinction there. And I do wonder what's far more interesting to me, or at least like, uh, especially listening to some of what was said prior to me, is that maybe this, um, especially in a, in a broad sense, this idea of nothingness is just meaning potentiality, um, existence that isn't any tangible thing or isn't any tangible thing as of yet. So what I'm thinking about in that sense is that I know it's definitely very broad and abstract, but I love thinking about these type of things, uh, that there's different realms of existence or that there's different types of existence, like can't the tangible from the intangible or not yet tangible. Um, so maybe nothing or no, which is just a broad not is just the um, intangible experience that we can't really or haven't yet defined. Not sure if that makes sense, but these are some of my thoughts. Oh, thank you very much. Thank mm -hmm. you. Very interesting. Thank you, Anton. And now Olga, sorry for the long wait, and then Terry. Okay. Okay. It goes the um, people hi. spoken. Uh, hi, guys. I um, uh, usually wait that someone say something that I would like to say, but today nobody's saying it. I um, would like to point to what you probably started with, what is like primary, what is secondary, not or is. And as I remember, you said that we cannot say not before we have something. Although if you look in creative process and ask any artist, any poet, or uh, anyone uh, like uh, connected to creative process, then it's usually condition that you don't know what it is. You know only that it, uh, that it does not exist, but what you have to create it. And only when it's created, you say, oh, that is, that is, you see? So uh, about secondary and like <laughs> in, in physics, they say like, fundamental and emergent. What is fundamental? What is emergent? It's kind of a question, but it's all relative questions. It's all relative, of course, to our existence. And um, so, and I would like to say maybe if we were not that serious about discussing it and like it's, and read uh, like uh, go to contemporary art gallery or read contemporary poetry or uh, go to comedy channel just now and listen to any comedian, then we will uh, see any type of con uh, conjunctive nonsense. And it will be very true. And it will be hilarious. But if it's not true, which is could also possible, that it will be even more hilarious. And it will create new meaning. That's uh, um, what probably I could say. That's I could say something also about AI, but probably that's enough. Just it's, uh, and I agree with someone, I'm sorry, that it's probably, I'm not sure who, uh, who said it already, I already forgot. Uh, that's, yes, we e exist in between, and I know poets who created new meaning uh, uh, using conjunctive nonsense, and of course, it's again, go to com comedy channel and listen to any comedian. And it will be obvious what they go, what they are actually saying. That's it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Olga. I, um, I think it was very interesting what you said about artists that start from. Yeah, what you're basically saying was that that something comes from nothing, and 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 that that's of course impossible. So the the nothing you were referring to was something. 
There was something no, moving in around. This in this case, of course, you're referring. You already know something. You already in the midst of yeah. something. Of course, it cannot be just say no, but it doesn't exist absolutely, and you cannot even imagine it. You have to create something that you cannot absolutely even imagine. You see, and it starts to happening. It's like creating from intention, but not from negating or uh, uh, confirming or whatever. Just from intention, create something, whatever you don't know what it is. Okay, that's very interesting. Thank you very much, Olga. Thank you. Bye. Terry, you're even more patient. Terry, you're on. Can you hear me? That's Terry, it. Terry, that, Terry, up next. Terry. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, no, no, uh, because I'm going along. People haven't said anything yet this time, to be fair. Okay? Teams are so similar that I thought you were saying, I thought you were saying Terry. No, no. I'm Terry with a okay. T. <laughs> All right. Um. One quick comment, uh, Frank Casamatis made an interesting thing about where AI could, could go. Uh, I, I think, Frank, I think you have a point that it could end to uh, a very negative outcome, just a general annihilation. But there's also a lot of assumptions that go on in what an AI might or might not have as goals. I think we tend to impose the behaviors we see in our own society onto what the AI might or might not do. Uh, in general, they're much more flexible than that. They could go in just almost any direction, including, uh, as I think we're tending to see right now, total chaos. Uh, because right now, they're assuming people are assuming these are AIs and they're not. And that's that's not going to have a good outcome, but it's mostly going to be annoyed the outcome. People basing their careers and companies on things that they think are smarter than they are, and actually they're dumb as stumps, uh, is not a good way to do a business. So, uh, but I think it is actually more optimistic that converging into a, a, a you know a common uh, strategy eliminating the othering actually could be a positive view of our current culture wars which have extreme othering well you know? we arguably humanity is already uh, how many human species do you see around you right now single one you know single one. understood oh, that's, that's, but that's culturally big... you know we've divided and I'm, I was kind of uh, saying that if there's a hope that artificial intelligence would eventually ab absorb the best of all non-me's into a singular thing, is that a potential path for our cultures to take? You know, as the, as the cultural conflict happens, some will dominate others. Will we get to a singularity in terms of our cultures? And I was hoping that we would. I think the best answer to that comes from science fiction writers who have postulated different futures. And it, it's extra, I, I would call it is extremely difficult to predict because the, the point I always come back to is computers and computer networks are not independent uh, ethical entities. They're, they're actually amplifiers. So it's, if you're, it's very difficult. That's why I asked this very smart group of your opinions. So yeah, thank you. If, if we program to be uh, antithetical to ethics, they will do a bang up good job of doing it. If we instead put into them a desire, or at least a program desire to, to create a more ethical society than that, I think that's entirely possible too. We can't take ourselves out of the loop though. We have to continually put in that steering guidance and this is actually the next 10, 20 years, I think it would be important for, for where we wouldn't go in those directions. What you say, I think, is a possible future of, of, of a good one where things could go on. My point about humanity is, though, we have done this scenario in a negative way before. There were many human species not that long ago. None of them are around anymore. And I don't think that's a coincidence. So the, the tendency for the kind of negative annihilation you mentioned is, is very much there. Uh, and it's, it's it's a part of the competitive dynamics of species. If you want to go back even farther, uh, a couple billion years, blue-green algae just about destroyed all life on Earth because they got greedy. They said, hey, I like this oxygen thing. Well, oxygen was toxic to every other life form on Earth at that time. 
and including eventually themselves. They froze the entire earth to a snowball a couple of oh, times. It's the cool thing about evolution, right? It's, it's the plan without the planner. The plan with yeah. And it can produce, but there is always that competitive aspect, but it always also has to be competition. One thing that happens if you get a monolith, then it breaks up internally. If you look at the history of the Catholic Church, at one time it was a monolith. But if you look inside of it, it was incredibly diverse. You had these very, very different groups fighting and competing and outright almost warfare with each other, still nominally within the Catholic Church. But the Jesuits versus the Benedictines in China was an interesting, just one little example of that where they were just just they were just about complete warfare, but they had very different goals, and yet they were part of the same monolith originally. So there, but that, a, but that's that's just simple evolution, right? I mean, they served a purpose at that time, and be, uh, then they when they no longer served a purpose, they were replaced. Yes, and the monoliths though tend to break down into those kind of competitions, and then they start competing. At a different level, they, they some things are established, the new things seem to tend to emerge from some of that. So it's just a very interesting dynamic. I think you make a very interesting point about where that's uh, where it's coming from. Uh, quick comment on uh, um, superposition, Dominic. On that, that's an interesting uh, issue in quantum mechanics. One of the things I would say that we should always be careful about in superposition is in quantum mechanics, as an example, it does not create things which don't exist. It only takes the superposition of things which do exist and which have been shown to exist. And that's an important distinction. One of the reasons why I have no respect for the many worlds perspective, and I know some of you may like it, but mathematically it's a it's a nonsense. It does it assumes that you simply create an infinite number of universes by the simple fact you can write down a matrix and say, and, and say oh, okay, I'm gonna fill them in. No, it doesn't work that way. Physics is more constrained than that. You have to actually have the time for the differences to propagate. There is a, a form of superposition, but it's based on the existence of those things that are being superposed. And that's what um, what Everett just completely didn't understand. I know he's extremely loved by a lot of people, but if you look at his PhD thesis and go through in detail, ah, it's it, it, he didn't understand what he was talking about, which is one of the reasons why I think he dropped out. Uh, but uh, and why he got a lot of opposition, but the idea is so incredibly appealing to people that people to this day just love it, love it, love it. And they don't bother with the fact that mathematically what he did didn't make any sense. It did not correspond to any form of actual physics. Now, I thought one of the most interesting questions, uh, uh, Samuel, you had a really good question about that issue of how do you go about defining what a knot is? Well, I, and what I would suggest, and one thing in that, if Think of it not in terms of not just as a as concept by itself, but every time you say not, you're attaching what you would call in computer science a predicate, a recognizer, something that says, I wish to look at something and say, is it or is it not in a set of objects? So I have a predicate that says apple. So I look at something and say, my, my processing says that's an apple. Well, then if you have the ability to make a decision with that predicate, you also make a decision that says it is not an apple. So what it is that every time, and this is where I think we get a little sloppy about using the word not, is there's always this dimension, this axis, this predicate that we attach to it. Sometimes it has two values. Sometimes like in a number system, it has an infinite number of values, but we always have something in our head or in our computer that defines this idea of what is that and then gives some kind of definition. Then separately from that, and this is what I thought your question was very interesting, is you have an assignment of value to whatever you get. You can assign value to the finding of that, or you can assign value to the not finding of that. And different people can do it in different ways. So I could have a case where somebody pushes the red button and that's that's the only thing that counts. And somebody pushed the red button. But you can also have cases where you look for something, you don't know personally what it is you're looking for, but you come up with a predicate that says, okay, by elimination, I know it's this. I don't know the value of that. The value is the separate assignment. So the other person has a separate assignment to that value. You don't have one, but you are able to find it. You have the predicate for it. So uh, it's an interesting question and um, gets into some of the issues of artificial intelligence and how you actually program these things. You have to deal with questions exactly what you asked about is how do you find it? How do you define what not is? How do you assign value to it afterwards? So there's an interesting set of literature assigned to that. And that would be my general comment to the whole group is 
When you say not, think not on what spectra, what is the set I'm trying to sign? Because if you don't ask that question, it gets very vague about what it is that you're trying to do not for. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Terry. Thank you. Um, okay. Debbie, you haven't been on yet. Yeah, I actually, um, from the beginning, from uh, uh, thinking about the concept of uh, not, and perhaps that could also be a, 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 a small uh, comment to what Samuel said, I'm thinking about the uh, <clears throat> Black Raven um, paradox, about uh, the paradox of uh, what happens when you say, in logical terms, that the statement, all ravens are black. Uh, so what you mean is that you we have observed uh, many ravens, 10,000 ravens, 20,000 ravens, or whatever, and we came to the conclusion and to uh, the statement that all ravens are black. This logically would be equivalent to all non-black things are non-ravens. So what is not black is necessarily would be no raven. So <clears throat> if I see a black raven, then that confirms my hypothesis that all ravens are black. But what is the paradox of what intuitively uh, gives us a bit of a, a doubt in our reasoning? What happens is that uh, every, if I see a white shoe, this, is, this would confirm the hypothesis or the statement that all ravens are black. So all I need to do is to observe things that are not black uh, and say, this is not a raven. So the, the paradox is that what is not black, my red uh, jumper now is a confirmation that all ravens are black. And here we come to a, an absurd conclusion. And I think that shows how we conceptualize the, uh, the concept of, of not uh, that um, shows us that uh, there is a problem with uh, <clears throat> using a not in re reasoning as a binary uh, way, in a logical way uh, of seeing it, uh, particularly in relation to what constitutes as evidence for or against a hypothesis. So I think it reminded me the, uh, the not of that paradox of how problematic the concept of not is in reasoning. So that was my uh, small contribution to the concept of not. <clears throat> Thank you very As much, Debbie. Non-binary <laughs> idea. Fair enough. Thank you very much, Debbie. <laughs> very, very, very interesting. Uh, okay, where are we? Josh, now we're going from left to right again. Left to right. Okay. Um, well, uh, from uh, what I've heard from the, the contributors so far concerning the way that they want to formulate uh, the not with regard to notions of presence and absence uh, of opposition uh, and, uh, and language is that we have various forms of sort of what I'd call sort of modernist uh, realism uh, in which the starting point uh, is identity. And there's then a necessity to explain where difference comes from, including the not. So not would be that you know, fundamental form of difference. Uh, if, if you start, if your starting point is uh, in identity, that is to say in presence, then what you end up with is something like, for example, uh, this discussion concerning narratives, you know, and that we sort of can't get out of our narratives and the world that we see is, is schematically represented to us on the basis of those narratives, kind of that Kantian uh, position. Or, you know, we could look at it from a, from a uh, cog sci, cognitive science perspective, and then we have a kind of a, uh, again, you, you have this uh, 
the subject object split and the subject now is the subject of neuroscience. And so you have an, an internal milieu uh, uh, that consists of a representational computational processing system whose goal is to pattern match uh, with an external world. So uh, when you have the subject or an inside on the one side and you have the outside opposed to it, uh, then um, the uh, you, you now uh, have a a notion of of what is in terms of correctness in terms of some notion of sort of matching uh, or mirroring um, and um, what um, it, what those positions leave out and uh, it, it is is a whole other way of looking at these things which uh, most people are still hostile to and those are various postmodern or post-structuralist positions, uh, which by the way, are not just put forth by philosophers, they're also put forth by people within the cognitive science community, such as an activism and certain embodied approaches within uh, within cognitive science that are informed by uh, things like phenomenology. And, and the difference there is that they don't start with identity or presence and then try to explain how the not or how difference arises, because when you do that, you put it in the past You say, well, you already have a system, say, within physics. Physics gives us this formal way of understanding and describing our world. And then the not is already taken care of it in a way. It's already explained to us because we, 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 we make recourse to that model in the same way that somebody who starts with a narrative approach says, well, we understand the not from within inside that narrative, some sort of a narrative scheme or other uh, that we can't get out of. Uh, or if you start from the cognitive science position, uh, then the knot is understood on the basis of pattern recognition. Um, the uh, or, you know so then you have this distinction between whether you rec whether you recognize something or you don't, whether you succeed or fail, whether it's correct or incorrect. But um, so what's the alternative that that's being offered here? The alternative is that we don't just determine whether things are correct or incorrect, whether they match or they don't match, whether we recognize something or don't recognize something, whether it's something is on the inside or the outside. Uh, instead, we're constantly in the process of interacting. Uh, we're, we're, we're performers. Uh, we don't use language as a tool. That's early Wittgenstein, which everybody's quoting here, but no one seems to um, be able to embrace or, or make use of the later Wittgenstein, who's very different in the Wittgenstein of the Tractatus, um, where we don't use language. Language enacts our interactions with the world. It's not inside us as a scheme that we consult uh, to constrain our world. On, on the contrary, it brings us out. It throws us into the world every moment. Uh, it confronts us with it. It's, it's not a question of having to be stuck inside a set of schemes and then having to explain how is it that we can uh, ever know an outside world? Well because we're never inside of anything to begin with. We are radically outside to begin with. Uh, our being in the world, is it should be the presupposition, not something that we have to explain or, 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 or look at as an achievement. Um, so, um, so, so getting back to the not, the not understood on, on the basis of, um, this notion that we're constantly not just determining what is or isn't the case, but how things are the case in, in, in a qualitative sense. That is to say, we're constantly determining um, what uh, what is at stake and what is at issue, what matters to us and what is relevant, not what is true or false from an epistemic uh, point of view. And that implies that we're always being thrown out ahead into new into a new world. So the not is the paradoxical way in which we're constantly thrown into new and, and rebuilt, remade by those new situations. The not is ahead of us as our future, not as something already uh, embedded within schemes that we can then analyze and structure logically to determine, oh, well, here, now we found the not within this sort of set of already determined uh, structures that were, you know, that kills the not. That, that, that's an artificially, uh, created that, but the real knot is the paradox that's that's embedded in our in our, in our experiences, especially in our uh, in language and how language uses us, like right now, as I'm speaking to you and you speak to each other, 
It recreates us. That's the knot. The knot is, is, a, is, a, is a fecund, creative, uh, future-oriented, uh, you know, um, exposure to what uh, is not familiar to us yet. All righty. I think I... <laughs> Thank you very much, Josh. It's very... Yeah. Very interesting points of view. Very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tim. Yeah, I just have a couple quick questions. One is, I assume everyone here has a will that is all except Samuel, who's only 11 years old, but many of us have written a will. And when we did so, we imagined ourselves not existing when we wrote our will. Secondly, um, specifically to Ron, uh, do you believe in the empty set, right? Is, is, is there such a thing as a set that has no members? Because it seems like you can't actually believe in that given your philosophy, but that concept is central to mathematics and a lot of the way we we view the world. So do you have to reject the view of an empty set? And if so, why not? Is that a, is that a question to me? Yeah. And well, do you have a will? <laughs> <laughs> Give me your name. I'll, I'll, I'll put a sum in there for you. <laughs> well, when you wrote the will, did you have to imagine yourself dead? No, of course I couldn't imagine myself dead. Obviously not. I knew, I knew that I will. I know that I will be, but I can't imagine what that will be. How, how can I possibly imagine not being? It's impossible. That's, uh, that's, all, that's oh, all I've been saying. Oh, I got you. All right. I, now I Frank, see what you're Frank, saying. Frank you're just saying A A S S A N I T S. Just for your records, Ryan. Pardon? What do you say? I didn't hear. Cassinets, Frank Cassinets, K A S S N I T, just for your will. Just okay, that's uh, two of you I've got to put in. Thank you. Uh, I've got to have fewer people on the Zoom, otherwise, I go, I really go bankrupt. Um, so you're no, saying so... you're you, no, it's, it's, I it's... can't imagine myself existing when I don't exist. So I totally agree with that. So there you are, then you see. Now I'll give you some more money, even right, but I can't imagine myself not existing in the world you can imagine yourself not existing in the world because that's what i do when i write a will no it's not correct no what do i do when i write a will you imagine you imagine that one day you will be dead but you're not imagining what it's like to be dead because you can't possibly imagine not existing you can only imagine what you're imagining but not i mean it just if you're asking about empty sets, but you're asking me, and you're asking me. And so we're both here talking about something that we're still here with, about, and from. But that's the yeah, point that's, I'm getting uh, getting across. You no, can't that's, ask. That's Lucretius. Right. Okay. That's that's fine. So if that's the point you're making, yeah. Well, roughly, that's yeah. somewhat, you know, we could use not in a lot of different ways. No. No. You see, oh, now I could use not no, to, uh, now you're to going, now you're going, you're going, imagine the world without me. No, you can't. Because the world I without can imagine you, the world without me. No, you can't. Because you're imagining. I just can't a, imagine myself not existing. No. There's a difference can, between those two things. I know, but you're imagining a world that you're not there, but you're imagining a world. Now you've got to not imagine the world and you not being there, which you can't do. That's my point. No, I can I right, can imagine right. a world where I'm I'm not there, but but I'm imagining a world, so I'm still there. Ta da! Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> do you believe in the empty set? Now the second. No, question. no, do no. I don't believe. No, no, set? no. I, that's not into with me believing. If you, well, my believing mean I'm here. I'm here, not believing. So that therefore that doesn't count. I can't Do you include the empty set in your philosophy. They, uh, that's got nothing to do with with not with with not with with the absence of everything, which including me imagining a non-set. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Be careful! I'll, I'll take some money off. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> Good. I think yeah. we cleared up some things. I think maybe we did. not everything. We definitely <laughs> did. We're, we're on the way towards nothing. Thanks. <laughs> Gary. Jack. Hey, Ron, I didn't know we were getting paid for agreeing with you. Oh, Jeez. of course. <laughs> why, else, why else would I pay somebody to not agree? Man, I, I'm going to have to be more agreeable from you now. You definitely on. do. <laughs> so I, I wanted to address something Terry said, and I think you just alluded to, and, and it's these ideas of, of boundary and, and set theory. And, and, and I think there may be a, diff a distinction in the quality of not. And here's an example for you. So you said early on that there were potentially an infinite number of not Janets, but only one Janet, right? Yet, well, there can also be potentially an infinite amount of objects that are not art, but an infinite amount of objects that are art. And that seems to imply a slightly different quality in at least the not not set. I don't know. Something something to throw out there to think about. Um, I think, Terry, you were exactly onto something with with a good critique of Dominic, Dominic's uh, uh, thing about superposition. Uh, if we're going to talk about Schrodinger's notebook and whether there's a drawing of a circle or a square, that would be what's in the superposition, whether it's a square or a circle. You can't draw a square circle and have it exist or not exist because there's no square circle to exist. So it's a distinction between what's in the superposition. Is it a circle or a square, but not the square circle? because that can't exist by definition. So I, I think that was a, a well-articulated point. And then to keep this quick, because I know time is of the essence, I have two questions for folks. One, can an imaginary universe be perceived by its imaginary inhabitants? All right, I think, I think that that might be a, a simple way to solve George's dilemma. And then Ron, this is, alludes to a past topic, and maybe we're coming full circle here. Does the past exist or does the past not exist? Because if the past doesn't exist, that seems to be problematic for the present. Well, I can answer and if it, that. That's not a difficult question. Okay. I've written a whole book on it. <laughs> and, and what's your answer? Remind me. I'm trying to remember. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the past exists as our memory the past is only our memory it's nothing else it it that's why that that's so why that's just an, that's another why we, word for the present no it's not it's not because because the present is keeping on moving to the past i mean in instantly instantly you have to read the book Okay. It just seems like if the present is built on the past, there has to be an not, element of existence, even not. though it's... No, 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 I never said that. The present, okay. the present never exists. It's too, it's too fast to exist. It, it, is, it is gone. It, it is the past instantly. And then it becomes our memory. And, the, and to our memory is added more of that X past and the memory keeps on moving back. That's why no two people have the same memory. And therefore, that you cannot say there is a past. Because if the past is, is reliant on your memory, and everybody's got a different memory, then you tell me what the past is, because nobody can, because every past is different. That's my simple answer. Okay, but there are no past memories that exist. Then I have to ask you what exist means. And that's... That's a, that's another hour or two, but, but I will I, leave. It, I will leave it there. I'm relieved, and and forsake any 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 uh, inheritance. <laughs> Be careful what you say; it's all recorded. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Kerry. Roland. Yeah, um, that 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 last few comments uh, had to make had to make me laugh. There's so many of these questions that come up where um, for a period of time, there's an assumption about what the wording means. And then suddenly it becomes obvious that no one knows. So that, that word exist is uh, like is. And, you know, and of course, we're talking about not. Yep. Anyway, um, 
uh, there was uh, several points I wanted to um, make. Um, Olga's point, I thought, was uh, is she here? So I don't know. Yeah, um, I thought was 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 really good, um, and it ties in a little bit with what I was saying earlier about the idea of searching for something. I remember going to a concert years ago in Halifax with Al Stewart playing, um, and he got through you know a few songs and. Uh, and then he started another song, which I can't remember what it was, but he got about 15 seconds through and he stopped. And he, he went up to the microphone and he said, no, that's not it. And, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, and then, of course, everyone laughed. And what was going on there? What was going on was he knew what he wanted to, to hear. He knew what the sound he wanted to create. Um, but could he have put it, in writing, could he have uh, made a, uh, a kind of detailed um, assessment of exactly what he wanted? Of course not. He wanted to hear a particular sound, and he could feel a dissonance that that wasn't that wasn't it. And anyone who plays a musical instrument will 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 know that so well. When you're playing a tune, and you're going, no, 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 that's not what I want to hear. Um, this isn't this isn't the sound I want to make. But you can't pin it down as uh, set of criteria. It's just a reference that we have inside us that you can go, yes, that's it, or no, it's not. And I think that relates uh, maybe to something about what Olga's saying, um, in that you can also start um, some creative endeavor without really knowing what you want to achieve, but knowing that there's a sort of pathway to get to it. And that pathway is a bit like a sort of each step may well be, yeah, that feels like the right step to take. So that's another version of identification or not identification. Um, a couple of other things uh, which actually tie together. One was about set theory and the other one was Debbie's um, example of the Raven paradox. I think there's a known sequitur in that paradox. So you see 20,000 ravens and they're all black. And then you go, oh, all ravens are black. But that's, that's a big jump there, isn't there? From I have seen 20,000 ravens and they're black to, oh, well, all ravens are black. So there's an objectification of ravens at that point and their blackness. And that le that's a big leap. It's a leap from observation to objectivity. And that leap is what creates the problem. Uh, what is the more rational um, uh, um, outcome from observing 20,000 ravens and then looking for another one is to say, I think the probability of, of uh, the next raven being black is very high. Now that makes sense to me. And of course, if you, if you couch the uh, rational conclusion in that way, that it's a probability based one rather than a matter of logic, um, then the logical aspect of uh, of uh, white objects not being ravens reinforcing the theory collapses completely. So I think it's all based upon a known sequitur um, uh, to all ravens are black. The other thing I wanted to say was about Tim, I did a comment about set theory and the empty set. I have a big problem with set theory because again, it lacks the observer. The observer has been removed from it. And so uh, when you refer to an empty set, um, in my, um, my way of thinking, for example, we could consider the square circle again. So you could have um, uh, in one set, uh, all events of experiencing a square and another set, all events of experiencing a circle. In the intersection, um, where both, where a, you know, we're looking for a single event of experiencing a square and a circle, you've got a null, an empty set. That makes perfect sense to me. The idea of um, objectifying members of a set, though, doesn't make any sense at all. And I think that's what Russell really discovered in his paradox. Um, he discovered a basic paradox in set theory. And if you actually look at what that paradox is and uh, what the roots of it are, it is basically about objectification of the membership of a set. But I think, actually, a really good idea for a smart mathematician would be to reinvent set theory 
by putting the observer back in and instead of having members of a set, having events of identification um, as representing um, elements of a set. So, oh, and the other thing I wanted to say, I used to be a solicitor and uh, I've drafted thousands of wills, well, hundreds at least, possibly thousands. And uh, I would say that um, uh, it's quite interesting talking to people about, um, uh, about their wills. Um, because they don't really imagine themselves dead. They imagine what they can do for their dependents or their relatives. So they're thinking, oh, I could, you know, I won't need this stuff anymore. So someone else can have it. So I don't really think they're thinking about what it's like when they're dead. I think it's more that, that sense of, I won't need this stuff anymore and someone else can have it. And how can I best distribute it? Anyway, that's that's my 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 my, my take on talking to a lot of people about being dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you got something out of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank okay, you very thanks. much, Roman. Thank you, Samuel. So when Kerry asked the question, if there were. If there's an imaginary universe and there are imaginary people, and if they exist in that universe, well, I, well, well, I would say in that universe they they do exist because let's say there was this planet and there were and there were lots of inhabitants on it, then it completely got destroyed and there was no trace of it, and then so and and if you just looked at that planet afterwards. You would have had no idea there was ever any inhabitants or any planet existing there. And if you're imagining things, it's like it's like in that short space of time, that planet did exist, even if it's not existing. And if you're imagining something, they are existing in that imaginary world. Everything's existing inside what you're thinking. They're not existing as in meeting a friend. They're existing as in I can think about what's going to happen, and my imagination is It's not. It's not like you can actually. It's not like it's not predictable. It's like your own imagination is forming that world. So the people do exist in your imagination. But 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 they don't exist in physical form. Dang it! I would say they do exist in your imagination. Samuel, you might love a book by a guy named Chalmers called Reality Plus. That's about simulation theory. I think you're ready for okay. it. Okay. Okay. I'll see you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samuel. Thank you. Great. Absolutely great. You're invited to come again. And I will. I think everybody wants you to come again, actually. Thank you, Samuel. Ginny, good well, to see you again. I just want to say what a treat to hear you speak, Samuel. I've been waiting the entire time. Um, so fantastic. Such a treat. Ron, we were very privileged today in this meeting, correct? Yeah. Correct. Correct. Now, it's very nice uh, that younger people come along because it's philosophy is not just for old fogies. It's 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 our lives and how we how we see things happening or not or not happening, actually, uh, in this particular occasion. Well, so, I've been talking about schools, elementary schools. Uh, having philosophy, introduction to philosophy to children for many, many years now. And I and I I see Samuel and I think, oh my God, he's starting it. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, we'll see how this goes. Uh, I hope it'll flower and blossom. I hope so. I, I happen to know by chance that uh, Debbie uh, teaches philosophy to very young kids. Oh. And that's a thing. So you should uh you should get together and have have a chat. Yes, sounds fantastic. That's uh, very very interesting. I think that's the future, and we should we should uh, definitely encourage that. 
although many countries are now going away from, they're going towards practicalities and going away from things that are just as important, which is philosophy and, a, and a how to think. Anyway, it's really well, wonderful. No, you, would, you would create a better world. I, yeah, possibly, possibly. Although I, although I have to say that the ancient Greeks thought that uh, philosophers should 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 rule their states and it was a terrible idea. So I'm not sure I'm not sure we should give the world to the to philosophers although I'm willing to give a try if you if you will vote for me. Okay. And no and no money is not involved here. Kerry. Sorry. Terry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Samuel keep those questions going. The uh you know, you hear a lot of noises, you read things because there's many different opinions. But I'd keep that question. You're you're asking good questions. You'd like to say, why doesn't that work quite right? And that's exactly what you need to focus on. So you can get insights, but um, cultivating that ability to question and ask is really, really important. So that's a good keep keep those questions going. That's good. Uh, I was going to comment on Rollins real quick. Ron, absolutely, absolutely agree that we need to get the observer back into the equations. The entirety of set theory is built on some of the most complex mechanisms inside of human brains. And I'm talking about literal wiring that you can see in diagrams. And people like Cantor just treat that as if that's a, a non-issue. And uh, it's not that you can't do that. You, you, you need to put the full equation of everything that's going on. So this idea of abstracting yourself out completely assumes that you're completely unrelated to whatever's going on. And there's reasons for that in physics why they do it. But in terms of information and concepts, you really, you really can't do that. You, 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 there's, there's ties and connections that, that make that into a, a non-viable approach for that. So uh, this is a problem I have with a lot of classical mathematics in general. It's just this incredible ignoring the, the the complex processes going on inside the brain just to make these things happen. A set is a very complex data set with lots of predicates, lots of, of operations going on, recognition, careful distinctions. Even when we've run, we've, we've had this discussion, one plus one equals one is an example. If you really, really, truly strip the one down to what is just one, then there's no left one. There's no right one. It's just one. And people are sloppy about that. They don't. They don't realize and say, "Oh, well, I am writing paper, and I am in my head. In your head, in your head, you're making a distinction between the two ones. You, you've got to keep careful track of it, and you cannot do it if you don't put the person back in to what's going on with it. And um, and uh, this gets. <laughs> I'd go back to the whole relativistic idea that uh, the, the observer is the one who makes this distinction about how to look at things, how to measure things, especially relatively puts the observer right in the center of things. But I think we've backed off from, from the very things that are so pointedly physical. Uh, we talk about exploding universes or incident against vacuums. That's because people haven't paid enough attention. So uh, just want to put that in. Thought that was a good idea, Roland. And yes, we need, we need to get people back in there. That's part of the process. And uh, great sessions. Good, good seeing everybody. Thank you very much, everybody. It was really great. Thank you, Samuel, for staying up so long. I presume it's late where you are. And um, thank you very much. And come again. You're always, you're always, you're always Some welcome. Recording. Thank you very much, everybody. See thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.